Good afternoon, everybody. It's Michelle Gallagher back from JD Gallagher Estate Agents. And today I'm joined with Pete Wood. Now, Pete has a very fascinating story. Um, we met accidentally through actually doing a StreamYard video uh, with his partner, Tiffany from Renis. And just like any typical bloke, he muscled into the screen, said hello. I asked him who he was. And what he actually proceeded to tell me, it was afterwards by by Tiffany. Peter is now absolutely fascinating me with this story. This is one about PPE and what they're actually doing to literally help save all of us. So I'm going to hand over to Peter to say hi, Peter. Hi there. How are you, Michelle? I'm dandy, thank you. Your story is one which... I've told so many people about, uh, we got off the phone and I rang my dad to say, I've met a real PPE man that's helping save the world. Um, but I want you to tell everybody, first of all, who are you and what do you normally do? Okay, I'm Pete, Pete Wood. Uh, normally I, um, I'm a business consultant, but a proper one. So I actually fix things. Often it's going into businesses that are trying to change the way they work or improve how they work and um and i take them through the process and hopefully deliver them through the other end with uh, you know better performance and ability okay so to go from that to actually making masks first of all how did you get into that well um <laughs> it's actually quite a strange story um my friend and i mark uh tiffany's brother actually um, we started a project um, to do with uh, glamping pods and things like that. And one of the things that struck us was how, you know, like everybody, we wanted to solve the homeless crisis. Um, grandiose ideas, um, but obviously not. it's not quite that simple. Anyway, we worked with, um, you know, ministers, et cetera, various charities, and were able to come up with an idea that hadn't been done before and it's early intervention accommodation um so the idea being that you provide the accommodation with very flexible um rules and regulations minimized and hopefully you're encouraging people to make the next step to to get the help that they need so that was in progress and we signed up with a major charity and until they announced it i can't say who they are but um it was all going ahead and uh and as part of that, we actually had a large supply of PP, uh, PPE. I was going to say PPI then, sorry about <laughs> PPE, um, that we needed for the project. And uh, anyway, obviously, uh, coronavirus started. So I made a few noises with local council and the NHS and said, look, I've got a load of this stuff. If you want it, you can have it. Um, and then I realised it was... a the situation was a lot worse than that. It was, there wasn't any. So I, basically we got drawn into first sourcing it. And then we decided, uh, Mark and I, to change his manufacturing from uh, renewable energy production through to, uh, to providing PPE equipment. Um, now there were a few things we produced, but mainly it was visors, um, full facial visors. And uh, the first thing we did was uh, share the design across the world so everyone could have it for free. Okay, so go back. We started. So Pardon? You designed the visor? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're very simple, but uh, it's, it's to minimise, you know, stuff coming in and comfort for the user who might have it on for four hours or more a day. Okay. And also, you could clean it, you know, basic disinfectant. Um, which are things that have to be considered. And so we did that and shared the model um, with other people around the world. Um, we started to provide for local hospitals and charities and things like that, and then realized it was, was massive. And at the same time, other organizations and individuals have started to say, look, we're doing this as well, but we, we don't know how to get it out there. So we put ourselves front and center and started to, um correlate you know the need with demand and supply and uh we we started to organize deliveries so we'd receive um you know models from other places 
put them together and then deliver them to hospitals. But then we started to get overwhelmed. So we put out a request for help, just like we'd done with the visors and, you know, the other bits of PPE. And uh, within 20 minutes, we had 50 uh, couriers offering service. Now, these were guys that are business owners, um, you know, engineers, accountants, lorry drivers, truck drivers, shop assistants, you name it, anybody that could get in a vehicle offered the services 50 in 20 minutes. So you know, people are out there and they want to help. We're able to, uh, we've got, I, I lost count the, earlier this week, uh, over 7,000 uh, deliveries and packages of PPE that we've been able to get out. Uh, that's gone 7, from... 7,000. Yeah, around Lancashire originally, and then through to Scotland, the North East, Yorkshire, and even Belfast and Birmingham. So when you talk about a package, what's the, you say 7,000 packages, is the numerous items in a package? Yes. So, for example, a package might be, you know, 15 visors. It might be 100 visors. Uh, it might be 100 visors and, and a few other bits and pieces you know, that we've been able to get hold of. The visors seem to be the main thing, though. So we've we've got them to places, to the various hospitals, um, care homes, etc. And so, you know, the success of that, we then got a call um, a week or so ago from a bunch of guys that had been working in Blackburn and Preston, and they'd been delivering care packages. And uh, the care packages consisted of... Um, you know, sugar, food, um, those kind of things. And what they were doing, it started with... a care package for Pete? Von, older and vulnerable people. So okay. something like uh, 1.2 million care visits um, that were scheduled to happen because the carers either can't get the PPE or can't get, uh, or are poorly themselves, or can't be covered to go into homes, those people aren't being visited. So people are struggling. And also, these guys then started to stretch themselves, provide the care packages, deliver prescriptions, uh, post letters, and, and then ended up making phone calls and just giving people the time and having a chat. But they were getting overwhelmed as well. And they realized they came to us and said, look, this is our problem. We need more volunteers, more stuff, and, uh, and a way of distributing it. So we, we've been working with them this week. We turned up at the police station in Preston on Wednesday to deliver some packages for frontline workers. And these guys have been doing a great job. So we're looking to, to kind of expand that. And again, the call goes out for more volunteers. And the, the amazing thing about all of this is how people want to help. So I used to work with a chap, he used to work with me, um, and he was uh, an IT technical engineer, a designer, and he has a food distribution business. That, whether he works for them, I'm not sure. And I told him about this situation, and he automatically said, listen, I will donate some of the production straight away for you guys. Just tell me what you need and where you need it. So, you know, again, one of the things today, we got a call, uh, there are some school children in, uh, in in local to us in Overton, they're not getting food, uh, you know, supplied by the schools. You know, the parents might be uh, poorly or not exist. And and the food is just not getting around the system. So we, when I finish uh, this call, I'll be carrying on with that and trying to organise uh, some supplies to those guys. But another really, you know, something that's come of this, apart from uh, the volunteers and all the good stuff, is uh, earlier this week we were able to deliver some equipment. And you think PPE, you know, as I've touched on, is for hospitals, nurses, carers. But there are schools for special needs. And we've been able to, um, through supporting them, they've been able to open 12 of these. And I, I don't know about you, education you know schooling is not something i've worked often with but special needs can sometimes mean these kids just do not 
get fed unless they turn up for school. So, you know, we've been able to uh, contribute to that. And we got 12 schools uh, opened um, in the last week. You know, so it's, wow. it, it's good for the soul. It, it's that's it. So uh, one of the things that I've read, because obviously having had our conversations, I've got this obviously mm. little obsession into, okay, what's this guy doing? Yeah. These masks that you're making is using a 3D printer. Is that right? They are. The the designs, all the designs are done through 3D printer. Um, we do have a facility where we turn it into a, more a, a standard plastic molding um, manufacturing. But the, most of the volunteers, it came from a 3D printing background. So we give them the design, the model. And it's uh, they go and produce it, and then they give it to us. We supply the plastic, and it's all been at our cost uh, to make the actual visor front. And um, and we've also spoken to manufacturers because the same model can be with a few adaptations turned put through a manufacturing process, which again has allowed us to speed up production and get it out there. And quickly, we we managed to get our a hand on a lot of the plastic that's needed for the visor fronts so we've been able to keep that supply up um okay you know so out of pure nosiness now yeah. how much does it actually cost to produce a mask the mask uh can range from around two pound fifty to four pound fifty to produce okay. um the, the the difference is um you know if we can put it into plastic molding then that makes it cheaper and faster but you still get they get the plastic screens as well okay so today um as you know i live down in Lytham. um i've mm -hmm. actually been to lanagan's fish shop um oh yeah so fish yeah and oh, two of them, not all okay two yeah. of the ladies in there are wearing an identical visor oh yeah okay which got me thinking one is it one of your visors or two, I know at the moment normal businesses aren't priority, but once you've fulfilled what you need to fulfill because that's complete priority, is this something you can then do where you actually sell to normal businesses, pubs, restaurants, bars, to help them get back open once we're allowed? Well, or I'm completely there. The, no, the answer to the question is yes. But as you know, care homes, um, banks, obviously, are all privately owned or publicly owned. They're not government and they're not NHS. Um, but mm. so far, um, once we got the frontline services and the hospices sorted out, we moved on to providing those. So, the, you know, it basically, if people ask, they tend to get. I mean, you know, we do try and push back um, and say, you know, with the care homes initially, it was like, well, look, we're providing NHS. Uh, if you guys want some, we could probably source you some, but we need we need a contribution. Um, and to be honest, we spent more time talking to them about it than doing it. That you know, this week a lot of the production uh, is going to care homes and 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 home care people because of the situation I talked about before with uh, home visits. Well, yeah, I mean, my grandma was severely disabled. I mean, I'm talking completely wheelchair bound and relied on carers. Yeah. So as it is, she's not with us anymore. But had she been, something like this would have been an absolute godsend. Yeah, you know? well, it is. It's, it's, I mean, the guys that are going out and doing the food, I mean, obviously all those lines will blur, but they've done it because they just care. Just decent chaps, um, you know, and they've started, together and realized that uh, that the need was greater than they can cope with hence the the approach to us so um we've been trying to do bits and pieces um and hopefully we'll ramp it up a bit more this week okay i'm going completely off anything now because i okay. noticed you've got a, a gofundme page for things for, to help we you have and you're going to ask me what it is aren't you <laughs> you'll probably come below afterwards for me but Speaking completely out of turn now, a lot of people out there are obviously raising money for various yeah. charities, and of course, the NHS is one of them. And yeah. I think we've all read now that the NHS charity wealth is absolutely essential. 
they're limited as to how they can spend that money because of <laughs> yeah. the confines of their charity, which a yeah. lot of people didn't understand beforehand. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, for instance, the 30 million that Captain Moore, that's now, what's he been made into a colonel? Colonel. That's yeah. Colonel Moore, his title right now. Of course, he's made a fantastic effort, but that money's got limitations as to how it can be spent on. Yeah. Using the GoFundMe page, is there not something then that the general public can do that helps raise money to get more visors out to people out there? And equally, not now, because businesses like myself aren't important in the scheme of it all, but maybe two months down the line, three months down the line, you have a product where people like me can basically pay to say, I want 10 visors. Yeah. I guess, I mean, look, when, when we're finished, um, you're more than welcome to share my email address. If I'm, and I'm really honest, we haven't even had a chance to think that far ahead. Um, we did speak with some uh, of the NHS uh, organisers yesterday because obviously they realised that things haven't worked quite how they should. And they're actually asking for thoughts on that. And would we continue afterwards? And the answer, and uh, I wasn't in the meeting, but Mark uh, said, we may or we may not. It depends on what you need. We we, we haven't thought beyond um, yeah. what we started with. We've got some kit. We can get our hands on some more. Do you want it? And it's just snowballed from there. So I guess if people need it, we can organise something. The GoFundMe at the moment is to really pay for things like um, – not all the plastic, but some of the the, the plastic uh, for the front. Mainly, it was for postage um, because we were just finding we just couldn't get it out there quick enough. Um, but um, but going forward, um, there'll be things like um, you know we've learned about the school near near to us that needs needs some help and needs some food. Well, that's kind of a today problem, not three months down the track. So. You know, no doubt it'll be Mark and I with our hands in our pockets and we'll we'll sort something out and then gradually ask people to to contribute. Um one of the people, you know, that's volunteered is uh, is an accountant. And we said one of the things, can you met you know, when we've done this, will you have a look at all the stuff that's come in? I mean, we're not talking lots of money, we're talking about maybe two thousand pounds, but that's a lot of contributions from people and every penny counts and you know, it's meant something to them. So we want to make sure that we've been transparent in uh, in what we've done and how we've spent their their money. It's so. an interesting one, the food, though, isn't it? Because obviously mm. you think the food bank that's around or people like that, but they are also seeing demand levels which they've never seen before. Well, you know... I- I've kind of the chap I told you about, the production guy, the food manufacturing and distribution, he he actually rang me up. The reason we were talking on this subject, or I wouldn't have had this conversation, was he was asking me. I'd worked uh, in care homes, you know, for care businesses before, with helping them with their services, and um, he was asking me how come he couldn't get the food in to them. You know, this is food bought by the government, paid for by the, the government, whether it's the NHS, I'm not sure. Um, and he couldn't deliver it. And he's got vans up and down the country. And we, we established that no one had communicated with the care homes that the food was coming. So say, for example, the ones I worked in are actually in Lytham and they're, um, they've got chefs on and fully functional industrial kitchen so they've not got a problem i said but if you turned up unannounced you wouldn't get in in a lockdown because that's security yeah. for the residents and uh, and so and i said how much waste did you get and he said it's incredible but it's down to lack of communication so i gave him some pointers and obviously you know said if you need any help give me a shout um, and we can knock on some doors um, because I've done a lot of work with government as well and, and you know, get this addressed. Anyway, I think it's getting some wastage, but not a lot. And he, he said, I said, what are you doing with that? He said, well, we're giving it away. I said, well, can you send some 
our way because you know we've got a need and your vans are in the area so so that's what he offered as well but it's, um, it's frightening when you think isn't it because obviously some people are living in a bubble world hmm. you know where the trip i mean I've, I've got a couple of friends who say it's great it's like a, a six weeks from the school holiday this you know i'm getting i'm getting paid you know yeah. i'm not spending as much money because i'm not going out to work i'm not getting a coffee a coffee at Nero's in the morning you know yeah. train fares and petrol and things and then you've got others at the complete opposite where they don't even know where they're going to pay for the next meal. Yeah, yeah. And it's a complete and utter. It, in, in a way, that's kind of where the story started with the homeless situation is you just, it, it's frightening how in that scenario, how quickly someone could fall from, you know, as, as one of my friends in one of the charities says, a steady eddy position into sheer desperation. And um, it's such a shame that that challenge is there. And this is where it really started. And you suddenly become aware of these things. But again, like you say, Michelle, I the idea that, I mean, I, I suppose it's naivety on my part, but the idea that kids needed school for to access food is 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 a little bit of a shock to me and yet it shouldn't be because a few years ago i volunteered to do some uh um what do you call it kit teaching assistant at uh, a deprived school so uh, so i was aware of it but um you know you just learn something new every day and the the challenge is to get the willingness and the giving of everybody everybody most people and and try and channel it and do the right thing of course it is. Well, why don't we in a couple oh, I've got to speak back. Why don't we in a couple of weeks have a catch up on that side of things to do with food okay. banks and homelessness and discuss how people can help with that? Would that work with you? Okay. Yep, that's fantastic. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much for your time. Thank um, you. If we can put links below, that'd be absolutely great. As I say, it's absolutely fascinating, even though it's happening on our own local doorstep. Yeah. So a big shout out to you, your brother-in-law, uh, your dad, I've read your dad involved, <laughs> um, and also all those people that are helping you get all this for you. No, thank you, Michelle. Really appreciate okay. it. All right. Okay. We will catch up in a couple of weeks' time and we'll discuss the matters with the food issues. Lovely. Perfect. Oh, by then. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.